30% of these people are turning up to be vitamin A toxic by the gold standard of a liver biopsy. Probably kind of around age 40 or 50, that vitamin A toxicity in the liver starts to accumulate. From that research, about 30% of the walking population is vitamin A toxic. Wow. My opinion is no one should ever eat liver, ever. Uh, and kidneys also. So the liver is kind of the body's primary storage organ for vitamin A and metabolizes it. But the kidneys are also catabolizing retinoic acid and, and some vitamin A. And you're absolutely right. In the liver, there's going to be a bunch of other good nutrients and detoxification enzymes. But I, I wouldn't make that trade off. You know, there would be other sources for those nutrients if you wanted them. And this is not just a theory. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Judy Cho and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner. I focus on root cause healing and often use a meat-based diet as an elimination diet. Okay, so I am excited, anxious to share this with you guys. This interview is so mind-blowing, um, powerful, and even you can have a little bit of skepticism. I interviewed with Grant Jenneru. He is a researcher. He's been studying a lot about vitamin A toxicity for the last six years and really digging into all of the research. I've read his blog and he is very well-versed in this. He's done a ton of research. And so you can always look into the study studies he cites and get into his free ebooks and also his blog posts. If you are doing a carnivore diet and just not feeling 100%, I would highly recommend watching this entire interview because it may give you some kind of tools or maybe some insight into what other avenues you can try while eating a meat-based diet. All right, let's get into the conversation. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy, and today I'm very excited. I have with me Grant Jenneru. Um, so Grant, thank you so much for joining me today. If you can just kind of introduce yourself um, and you know your research and how we're interviewing. Sure. Um, so my background is actually a uh, civil engineer uh, with a bit of a minor in geology. So um, and then kind of the second half of my career is probably spent um, mostly in computer software. And so I had up until 2006, I really had no interest in the health sector and most certainly not the alternative health sector or anything else. I was just going all, along with my life. Um, then unfortunately, I got a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease in 2006. And so that was kind of my first, um, you know, health incident, if you want to call it that. And I um, wasn't given a very good prognosis and I, you know, just, there's nothing I could do about it. So I just kind of went on with my life. And then by about 2014, uh, my health really uh, started to um, uh, deteriorate really dramatically. And I developed uh, eczema, uh, what we call eczema in Canada. I'll use the eczema, American pronunciation. <laughs> uh, so I had um, you know, first, uh, for the first few months, it was kind of minorish, you know, the fingers, the back of the hands. And then I had this episode where it just exploded into body wide um, adult eczema. And I went to my doctor, of course, and uh, he said, there's nothing we can do for you, you know, just go home and deal with it. And that was really a great um, thing for him to have done, because I think it was the appropriate thing to do one. And two, it put me on the path of uh, trying to figure out, you know, what could I possibly do to alleviate some of these symptoms. It's a pretty uh, horrible, nasty condition, um, especially when you have it, you know, severely. Uh, so that, uh, you know, put me on the road of trying to investigate, you know, is there something I could do about this? I never for even a second thought I was going to be able to cure it on my own or put it in full remission on my own. I just thought maybe I could reduce the symptoms of it. And so what I did was, uh, it's kind of, you know, within an hour or two getting home from my doctor, I, you know, went on uh, Google and started searching, you know, what, what are people saying about uh, eczema? And I did something what I thought was, you know, really, really straightforward. And um, one of the things that kind of struck me uh, right away was, you know, not only the medical community, but kind of people experiencing eczema documented that they had these trigger foods. And right away, that kind of sounded a little bit suspicious to me, you know, the 
sentiment is that yes, there are these trigger foods that can make the condition worse, but they're not responsible for the disease. They can just cause you to go into flare-ups. But okay, I kind of sort of was buying that. So what I did then was I took all the uh, components of the so-called trigger foods, you know, they would be milk, eggs, um, dairy, um, fish, and some other, other ones, and I went to the nutritional database. I got all the molecular compounds that are in these foods and put them into a database. And I did a search and said, you know, what's common about these foods? And lo and behold, uh, vitamin A popped out as being kind of the unique common uh, element um, among the so-called trigger foods that cause people to go into a, an eczema flare-up. And so from there, um, I decided to just conduct a little personal experiment. And I, once again, I didn't expect really anything to come from it. I thought it was kind of foolish and ridiculous. Um, so I decided to eliminate all vitamin A from my diet and uh, just went on a really low vitamin A diet for about three weeks. And in those first three weeks, kind of, you know, nothing was getting any better. Nothing, maybe not really getting worse, but most certainly not, nothing was getting better. And then almost kind of overnight, um, I started to have some really big improvements in my health. And unfortunately, it wasn't really the eczema that improved first. It was, uh, you know, joint pain, chronic fatigue, thinking clarity. So just a really dramatic kind of shazam kind of moment for um, uh, these health conditions to start to uh, resolve long-term health conditions. And so from there, I thought, well, you know, this, this is really too simple, but, you know, possibly I'm onto something. And I started digging into the medical uh, literature and research around vitamin A. And kind of from there is, uh, you know, how I, I got involved in this. I, um, and I saw some of your blog posts and they're pretty extensive. And I know you get into kind of the molecular structure of vitamin A that maybe right. it's not even a vitamin. So can you, you know, kind of explain to our audience, you know, what, what why you don't think it's a vitamin and, you know, maybe for the layman uh, person to just explain your research. Sure. You yeah. Well, this is a, you know, this is a very big research area, not just for me, but for the medical community. I think vitamin A is probably one of the most widely, thoroughly researched uh, molecules in all of medical science. Uh, when I first got into this, I did a bit of a, you know, two minute meta analysis and I just went out to PubMed, and, you know, how many papers are on PubMed regarding vitamin A? I think there's 7,500 when I search, you know, and actually a very trivial search, not a, not a thorough search. And there are about, out of 7,500, there are about 450 on the toxicity of vitamin A. So um, it's a very mixed message with vitamin A. Um, if you read really pretty much you know, any research paper on vitamin A, there's this, almost this obligatory preamble about you know, vitamin A being an essential uh, vitamin. It's needed for cell differentiation. It's needed for embryo development. It's needed for, you know, the maintenance of um, skin. And of course, vision. Vision is kind of the big one. And the, you know, the claim is that vitamin A is save, you know, millions of people every year from, from death and blindness. And, you know, it's, um, but when you, uh, when you really dig into it, uh, which I did was I went down the path of trying to understand how was this determination about vitamin A being made that it's actually a vitamin. That took me way back to uh, the very early research in the 1920s when the first investigation uh, was made uh, regarding vitamin A. And there are kind of a handful of studies in the 1920s, um, but a very small group of researchers. So this is kind of a, a bit of a cadre of people that were deliberately looking for something, you know, they could call a vitamin. And out of that research, kind of the primary paper that identified vitamin A to be a vitamin was one by Wilbach and Hall in 1926. And uh, my analysis of their study uh, is that that's completely botched science. It's very bad science. And there's a lot of complex reasons why I believe that. Uh, but that is the cornerstone study that has formed the basis and the foundation of vitamin A uh, theory going forward to today. And um, if that study is indeed flawed, and um, then I hope, you know, the whole crusty foundation of this whole vitamin A science will, will come crumbling down. So that is kind of where I'm at uh, with it. I've been looking at it, uh, investigating this for about six years now, six and a half years. So I think I've done a pretty thorough examination of the research. Once again, you know, there's just tons of research on vitamin A.
there is no question, like no question whatsoever uh, in the medical research that vitamin A is toxic. There's lots of papers about the toxicity of vitamin A. And it's also complicated and tricky. Uh, so it's not straightforward. But so maybe one that if people are interested in and looking at is one in 2006. Uh, I think it's published on the National Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and it was called The Acute and Chronic Toxic Effects of Vitamin A. This is an important paper because uh, these two authors are looking at vitamin A from a toxicity point of view um, chronically. So maybe let me back up. So in the medical research, when someone researches the toxicity of vitamin A, uh, there's kind of two categorizations of that toxicity. One is acute and the other one's chronic. So acute uh, toxicity, of course, you take a large dose and you get sick and, you know, sometimes you die. Um, so that's uh, what is really kind of most of the research prior kind of to 2000. But there's lots of awareness in the medical community about that long-term uh, chronic toxicity of vitamin A. So this is no, you know, this is no theory. There's been well-documented cases of people being inadvertently poisoned to death with vitamin A, either through, you know, medical interventions or people taking vitamin A think, supplements because they think it's good for them or something like that. So there's no doubt about vitamin A being toxic. But uh, so that one paper I mentioned is, is a good one for people to kind of get an understanding about chronic toxicity of vitamin A. Uh, but before that, in the 1960s, 50s, 40s, kind of chronologically going back dec by decade, there's been lots of studies of, uh, with uh, the toxicity of vitamin A. There's a really good one done at the Iowa State University. Um, I think it was done in 1960, and it was the effect of hypervitaminosis A on young pigs. And this is a you know, super well uh, done study. Uh, I won't go into the details of it, but basically these researchers just poison young pigs to death uh, with vitamin A, high dose vitamin A. It's, it's actually horrific reading their research paper. I mentioned some other studies in my uh, ebooks that were done. Um, one in 2010 about the toxicity of vitamin A palmitate, which is a particular type of vitamin A. Uh, another one uh, that I think is really worthwhile for people to read if they're concerned about vitamin A toxicity or have any doubt about vitamin A toxicity. A uh, research paper done in Norway um, is called the the title of the paper Scripters, which is Writings, and it's Hypervitaminosis A, the study and effect of excess vitamin A in animals, I believe it was. It was done in Oslo, Norway. And much like the researchers at Iowa State University, uh, they are looking at the toxic dose of vitamin A in all kinds of animals. They poison dogs and guinea pigs and uh, chickens and just all kinds of animals, and they slowly poison these animals to death and then look for, you know, the uh, the tissue manifestations of that and the actual cause of death. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a shocking paper to read. You know, those are some of the evidence that, you know, I'd give to people to understand that vitamin A can be toxic. Of course, the argument would be, um, the counter argument would be, well, hold on, it's only toxic when you get a high dose of it. Uh, but once, once again, kind of bring you back to that 2006 paper I mentioned where, you know, these researchers are saying, hold on, you know, this bioaccumulates. So, even though it might not be toxic, um, appear to be toxic in the short term, over the long term, it's going to accumulate and you're going to saturate your liver stores with it and your other tissue stores. And once that happens, you kind of reach a tipping point where now even small doses that you take are going to become toxic. So what's really tricky about vitamin A is that you can uh, consume vitamin A for a very uh, long time, like decades and decades and decades, and have no observable ill effects. And then all of a sudden, kind of one day, it's going to slowly start to manifest itself. Uh, so that's the tricky, insidious nature of it. On the flip side, you'll have a bunch of research that claims it to be an essential vitamin. I think that's that's wrong, as I mentioned. The, you know, several thoughts, but um, one, what would we even define as toxic? So, you know, if we're just kind of accumulating it, is there even a way to check? And I think in one of your blog posts, you say it's very difficult to, but, and then the other question is, so what would be like a safe amount we can eat daily um, that you would consider even safe? Yeah. Well, first off, uh, the safe amount is going to vary. It's going to vary on you know, someone's age, prior health history, prior dietary history. So it's, it's a moving target. And as you get older and older, that safe amount is going to become smaller and smaller because it does bioaccumulate. So the RDA for vitamin A has changed. Uh, you know, I think a decade ago it was 5,000 international units. It's now down to 3,000 international units. Even those amounts are actually documented in the medical literature being borderline high. 
So in my view, you want to be very careful with this substance. It's like I said, it bioaccumulates. On the positive side, the body is super well equipped to deal with it. You know, like, you know, we've evolved with this fantastic liver that metabolizes and catabolizes vitamin A. Other tissues do the same thing. So you can most certainly take, a, you know, a daily dose of it at a reasonable amount and live a long, healthy life. So it's not, it's not going to, you know, small doses are not going to harm people. It's this, this cumulative you know, moderate to medium dose over a long period of time that is going to result in a toxic condition. And so what would someone uh, kind of be on the outlook for uh, trying to determine if they're becoming toxic? Um, some of the signs are dry skin, dry eyes, uh, hair loss, elevated LDL uh, levels. Um, so change in, in blood chemistry, osteoporosis, bone pain, you know, there's just a huge list of, you know, symptoms of vitamin A toxicity. And it's all going to happen very, very slowly. So that's the kind of key thing for, for people to understand. This is not something that happens quickly or overnight, unless you've kind of mega dosed with it. So this is just a slow picking away at your tissues and primarily your stem cells, and it's going to uh, eventually catch up to people. Can you test for vitamin A toxicity? Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, so the de facto test that you'd go and get from your doctor is a vitamin A serum level test. And it's not really indicative of your vitamin A levels at all. It's just indicati indication of how much vitamin A you have circulating in your serum. And most of that that they measure is in a, in a wrapper protein. So it's not free in, in serum. But that does not really reflect the liver store. So there's some really great case studies where people were vitamin A toxic in, in their liver, increased uh, their protein content. And what happened as a result of that is their serum level of vitamin A just shot up dramatically because all of a sudden there's a protein for the liver to, um, to wrap it up in. A serum level test is not great, but there is a range uh, that a doctor could test for and say, if you're over this certain range, that's that limit, then you'd be, quote, uh, vitamin A toxic. The gold standard for measuring vitamin A toxicity is a liver biopsy. And, you know, no way sh should people just go uh, and do a liver biopsy. It's, you know, it's a dangerous test with uh, a lot of complications potentially. And there are some fluorescence techniques to measure the vitamin A accumulating in the skin. So the vitamin A that accumulates in the skin is uh, primarily the carotenoids, uh, the vitamin A beta carotene uh, form of it. And so there are some very sophisticated lab techniques for actually measuring that quantity. But once again, it's not, not available to just, you know, the general public. So it's really kind of funny because, um, you know, this is well known in the medical literature that this is going to bioaccumulate, could potentially become a problem, but there's no great test for measuring it. Where I struggle is um, a lot of the symptoms you mentioned, you know, a lot of diseases and illness, they have very similar symptoms. Oh, yeah. So your dry eyes um, can mean like a vitamin deficiency sometimes, um, thinning skin, hair loss, all of those can also be related to the thyroid. And so how do we know, do you just do an elimination, a diet of, you know, removing the vitamin A's to then see your improvements um, in these areas? Or, you know, like, how do we know that those symptoms are really vitamin A when we can't even really test for it versus maybe it's my thyroid, you know, it's all the other conditions that all these other things normally come up. Yeah, no, I, I totally get your question. And um, I agree. So there's a lot of uh, overlap here with thyroid and, and vitamin A. Yeah. And you're right, there's a lot of overlap and mimicry between, you know, all these health conditions. How does someone actually know? I guess the answer is we don't. Um, you can, you know, suspect. And uh, I think that's kind of what's what's happening uh, with people that are joining this community and, and experimenting with this to kind of, you know, help prove it out. There's a great resource if someone wants to check this out is uh, there's a website called acne.org and then they've got a page, uh, page for Accutane. So I don't know if you're familiar with Accutane, uh, acne um, medication, they call it medication. And on their site, they have a list, a really good kind of visual and diagram of, you know, all the adverse health conditions that'll are documented in known side effects of taking Accutane. And the reason I mention Accutane is Accutane is um, what's called the active form of vitamin A. So this is uh, 13 cis retinoic acid. So when we consume vitamin A from food, uh, either plant food or animal food, eventually that vitamin A is, that's going to be catabolized, it's going to be broken down. And one of the steps of that is uh, the breakdown of it into retinoic acid. And so the reason I mentioned that website is that 
you know, that diagram that they have with all the health conditions associated with Accutane, one, you know, that's super well known, proven list of side effects. You know, millions of people have taken Accutane. And Accutane is also uh, used as a chemotherapy drug. And so once again, there's millions of people that have taken Accutane or retinoic acid as a chemotherapy. And these are actually, you know, the listed side effects of chemotherapy with uh, retinoic acid. So what everyone needs to understand is that your body, when it uh, metabolizes or catabolizes vitamin A, it breaks it down into exactly that same chemical. There's some isomers, but that's kind of splitting hairs. But that is the natural pathway for vitamin A to become active. And so, you know, someone wants to check that out, say, you know what, you know, how many of these symptoms do I have? And kind of the more of them you have, the more uh, suspicious that you should be that, you know, maybe you are dealing with vitamin A toxicity. And I'll just mention that there's been studies done with cadavers, uh, both in the United States and uh, in Asia, one actually done in Canada too, you know, really good studies where they've taken cadavers from accident victims or people have died from, you know, other causes and uh, they've done liver biopsies on them. And it's about 30% of these people are turning up to be vitamin A toxic by the gold standard of a liver biopsy. And some people are young, some people are older, but it's quite surprising. Uh, so there's kind of a peak in, in young children for vitamin A toxicity, then it drops off and it kind of slowly builds up into your adult years probably kind of around age 40 or 50, that vitamin A toxicity in the liver starts to accumulate. And so uh, from that research, you know, about 30% of the walking population is vitamin A toxic. Wow. Where, where do you think our sources of vitamin A starts? I mean, you mentioned, okay. acutane, but I mean, are we born with, you know, if our mother had it, would we, you know, get some, I mean, kind of where does it start? And then what foods and we can get into that. Yeah, sure. Well, I don't think anyone needs to be concerned about how much you get from your mother. That's a, that's a long time ago. So um, all vitamin A really originates in plants. So as uh, the carotenoids, and kind of the primary one that people need to, you'll hear about is the beta carotene. So beta carotene is two vitamin A molecules bound in, in, this, in the center. So it's you know, kind of a mirror image of these two molecules in a beta carotene. So uh, what happens when an animal or we in, uh, eat a plant source of, of beta carotene, some of that's cleaved and split in part. Now we have two vitamin A molecules. Maybe I should just back up for a second. So the term vitamin A in the medical research refers to a whole group of uh, molecules. And it's really kind of, you know, any molecule that has vitamin A activity. And then you kind of have two branches. You have the beta carotene branch of that, or what's called the proform branch. And then you got another branch called preformed vitamin A. And that preformed vitamin A comes from animals. So we can, and of course we do, get some vitamin A from animal foods, but that all also originated from those animals eating plants. So really all vitamin A originates from plants. Does it really matter? Probably not because for if you're a vegan, that's a bit of a concern. If you're a plant or a meat eater, that's a bit of a concern. It really doesn't matter about the origin. It's just there. There are some differences though. So beta carotene uh, that you get from a plant source is absorbed through the intestine only about, you know, it's going to vary by individual, but maybe 80% of it. Uh, where the preformed vitamin A that you get in animal foods is much higher uh, absorption rate, maybe Unless oh, it's beta carotene, 80% of it's going to be passed through, 20% of it's going to be uh, absorbed. With preformed vitamin A, retinol or retinol palmitate, which you can get from animal sources, is much more readily absorbed. Maybe 80% of it's going to be absorbed. Eventually, that beta carotene, though, if it, it does get absorbed into your, into your tissues, is going to break down into two vitamin A molecules, and then eventually it's going to break down into retinoic acid. And uh, uh, that's kind of the, the pathway there. When you're saying, though, that it gets more, I just want to make sure and clarify, mm -hmm. but when you say that the, you know, the animal form, it gets better absorbed, does that mean that we would actually get more vitamin A from meats than if we were eating beta, beta carotene? Well, no, it depends on the type of meat because, you know, different meat has different concentrations of vitamin A. Uh, some fish is high, tuna is high, salmon is kind of medium, I suppose. Uh, the fish oils can be really high. Uh, so something like cod liver oil would be disastrous, disastrously high. 
muscle meat is, is actually very low in vitamin A. Certain cuts of meat might be slightly higher based on their fat content and the age of the animal. So there's lots and lots of factors. Uh, liver, uh, animal liver, beef liver, is one of the highest sources of preformed vitamin A. So it, it depends on the type of meat. So. so let's say the percentage of, you know, in 100, 100 grams, let's okay. say the meat has, let's say beef liver, you know, it's really high in vitamin yeah. A. And then let's say in carrots or something, there's a lot of vitamin A as well. Would the liver, and I know the liver is really high, but let's say, are you saying that the liver or the meat variety would be more absorbed by the body? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And especially so if you include any fat in your meal. So the preformed vitamin A, which we'll, we'll call, which is typically called retinol or retinol palmitate, that's a fat, a soluble molecule. So if you have fat in the same meal that you're eating, you know, a meat source or an animal source of vitamin A, you're going to have a higher absorption rate. Whereas the beta carotene, not so much so. And even by the nature of the molecule itself, it's not so highly absorbed. Eating a carrot, you know, is <laughs> not that much of a concern, but uh, eating something like an animal source, such as liver, you know, that would be a huge concern, in my view. How, so most people don't eat liver, right? So I know right. in the meat-based world, there we push liver, but yeah. outside of us, <laughs> there's not a ton of people that eat liver. So right. where are we getting a lot of this vitamin A toxicity? Well, uh, yeah, very unfortunately, especially if you're in the United States has been added to, you know, a bunch of the food uh, in the United States and in Canada. So in the 1970s, vitamin A was added to milk and dairy margarine. And this is um, vitamin A palmitate. And this is the preformed version. So one is the version that's most highly absorbed. Two, it is um, in a food that it was never kind of naturally part of, I guess, especially the skim milk and the margarines. Uh, another source is the seed oil, such as canola oil and some of the other seed oils are very high or high in the carotenoids. And the problem with that, it's already emulsified in an oil. So if you're eating canola oil or consuming can canola oil, you are going to be consuming, you know, most of that beta carotene that's in that canola oil you're going to absorb because it is wrapped up in a lipid already. Historically, you know, our plant-based diet was seasonal. So we might have some high vitamin A foods in the fall at the end of the fall season. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, not so much. And we would have uh, meat and, and, you know, fruit in uh, kind of throughout the year, but that was not supplemented. But right now in the United States, uh, they've also supplemented uh, bread flour, uh, breakfast cereals. So there's been a big you know, supplementation program going on um, throughout the United States and really throughout the world for vitamin A and the uh, consumption of multivitamins. That's kind of a new factor kind of since the 1970s. So there's a lot more vitamin A being consumed. Uh, I actually did see a good chart of this and it's um, if you look at look at it graphically, there's there's been about a 30% increase in vitamin A consumption, kind of generally speaking, since the 1970s wow. uh, in the United States. So it's not a 300%, but it's still 30% is kind of significant, especially once again, it, it's it's you know doing the integral of that curve over time. So if you were to take Accutane, I mean, does that put you at a very a much higher risk of the um, vitamin A toxicity? Like if you oh, yes. you're younger, okay. Oh yes. So Accutane is um, it's a devastating uh, uh, chemical. This, in my opinion, there's no way it should ever still be on the market. Um, but there's kind of two two reasons it's so devastating. I believe one is it is um, you know incredibly toxic by itself. Uh, so this is, quote, the active form of vitamin A. And there's many, many people that are devastated by that. And there's a lot of people on my forum that have come from uh, taking Accutane. And, um, you know, what's documented in the medical literature is that these, quote, side effects are often permanent, and some people don't ever recover from them. But the secondary part of it, I believe, is um, it's not just being exposed to a toxic dose of vitamin A. So when you're you know, being exposed to high level vitamin A, your body is catabolizing it. Like I said, we've got really good defenses against vitamin A, liver and a bunch of uh, detoxification enzymes. When you take Accutane, you kind of use up that reserve of those detoxification enzymes. And so now you're at much bigger risk for ongoing vitamin A toxicity than you would be if you had never taken Accutane. So Accutane is kind of a double whammy. One, it is, it's a direct acute poisoning and it's reduced your defensive measures against ongoing vitamin A consumption. 
what if I just took enzymes or liver supports? You know, there's a ton of like liver detox. I mean, would that help get rid of the vitamin A toxicity? I mean, yeah, uh, I I don't know. I haven't looked at that. Um, Sure could be. And that's kind of where we are in this, you know, this community that is growing up around this, this theory is, you know, we are looking for better, safer ways to uh, try to detoxify from vitamin A. I haven't specifically looked at, you know, liver enzymes, possibly. You know, what's interesting is a lot of animal foods have vitamin A, right? So we talked about liver, eggs Mm -hmm. have it, um, butter is a big source too. So in your opinion, do you think that we shouldn't be eating these foods or? No, I think, um, no, I think we just need to be extra careful. We need to, one, come to an understanding that vitamin A is not a vitamin. That's my personal theory on it, yet to be proven. Uh, and we just need to be prudent about, you know, how much we're consuming because it does bioaccumulate. So if something like liver or cod liver oil, I think would just be, you know, no one should ever consume those foods. Um, it'd be hard to even call them foods. But things like butter, milk, and cheese, you know, in reasonable amounts are going to be fine. Uh, some of the things to be on the outlook for is um, consuming vitamin A containing foods with breads with emulsifiers or other emulsifiers would increase your rate of absorption of it. So foods that have lecithin, some you know other kind of emulsifiers that are put in a lot of common foods uh, like soy lecithin that emulsifies or wraps up vitamin A and brings it through the digestive uh, wall. I think people just need to be aware that this is a potential problem and, you know, be prudent about how much they're consuming. So for my book, I did research on different nutri- nutritional profiles on animal-based foods. And okay. one, of the, one of them was beef liver. And okay. the vitamin A amount for four ounces was about, I can't remember the exact number, but it's about 624% of your daily value. So here, let me okay. real quick. It's um, 5,614 micrograms. Okay, okay. That's so... Based on, you know, what everything you're saying, and then there's on top of that, there's a separate excess dose of copper. um, And there are people that are copper toxic. So okay, do you, you know, it's it's a fact that organ meat has a lot of nutrition, but then there is a lot of vitamin A. Yeah, I mean, even for the four ounces, there's 620% of your daily value. So would you say maybe we just limit our um, organ meats to maybe of three ounces a week? Oh, man. Um, you have well, an opinion I, I, on that? I'm giving you my opinion, of course, yeah. right? And so my opinion is no one should ever eat liver, ever. Um, uh, and kidneys also. So um, the liver is kind of the body's primary storage organ for vitamin A and metabolizes it. But the kidneys are also catabolizing retinoic acid and, and some vitamin A. So the kidneys would be, you know, toxic source. Um, the liver would be toxic source. It's going to depend on the age of the animal too. You know, most beef cattle in, in North America is harvested at kind of less than three years of age. So it's actually not going to be that toxic. And you're absolutely right. In the liver, there's going to be a bunch of other good nutrients and detoxification enzymes. But I, I wouldn't make that trade off uh, kind of, you know, there would be other sources for those nutrients if you wanted them. And this is not just a theory. Um, you know, this is, it, it's proving out in real life. So we've got a, quite a f- number of people uh, now in, uh, I want to say on my forum in this community, the vitamin A detoxification community, that have come from the, you know, carnivore diet that included liver are now quite sick and trying to detoxify themselves. And likewise, for people coming from the Western A. Price uh, Foundation that have been consuming cod liver oil, extremely, extremely sick and uh, are now trying to go through this process of detoxifying it. So the trade-off is just not worth it, in my opinion. I I know we talked about certain symptoms, but what are some main mm-hmm. symptoms? I know you had eczema. Yeah. Um, so I think the main symptoms are going to be, well, it affects the entire body. So people need to know that it, mm-hmm. it, vitamin A it slowly poisons the entire body. So but I think the most common ones are going to be GI issues, cognitive issues, anxiety, depression, skin issues, uh, dry eyes, uh, hair loss, problems with uh, their teeth and gums, uh, the symptoms of scurvy, you know, mouth ulcers, uh, I'm just trying to think here, Um, you know, poor bone development, osteoporosis. So those are probably some of the big ones. 
What's interesting is that in the carnivore community, a lot of people heal their gut or they heal a lot of the skin issues, right? So they, yeah. if you sk- heal a lot of your like small intestine and you now have a stronger small intestine, that's where a lot of your immune health is. And so then people see healing in their skin. I think uh, from the medical research, um, you know, I think the skin issues are more predominantly if caused by beta carotene. So the, the pro form versions of vitamin A. And people see this when they, you know, they eat you know, too many carrots or sweet potatoes or, you know, squash, their skin turns orange. So you can literally see, you know, beta carotene accumulating in someone's skin. So I think that's primarily... Um, the driver be- behind eczema and probably uh, psoriasis. And there's been several young men on my forum that coincidentally both are in Australia that were eating sweet potatoes for a number of years. Both of them developed very severe eczema and you know went off the sweet potatoes and recovered their skin. So I think it's pretty good evidence that beta carotene is the bigger factor for the skin issues. However, this is a tricky, tricky um, topic because if you're consuming, um, you know, vitamin A, the preform, the animal form um, of vitamin A, retinol or retinol palmitate, that is predominantly going to get stored in your liver. So it kind of protects your other tissues from its toxicity, and the liver is going to deal with it slowly over time. So it won't manifest itself in the skin so much. But eventually, uh, your liver is going to become saturated and diseased, and then you're going to be in trouble. And then when you talked about these other fats, so a lot of people make liver into pâtés with butter. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so That's you're, I'm disastrous. You're... <laughs> Absolutely disaster. But you know, once again, uh, you know, people need to uh, read the read the research. There's just tons and tons of research on vitamin A. Both there's lots of research advocating for vitamin A and and you know talking about its benefits and there's lots of research talking about the toxicity of it and you know don't go on my opinion you know people need to read the research and decide for themselves so what's your diet like then well uh let me first say that what i do with my diet i'm doing for a very specific scientific reason so this is not a diet that someone should mimic or you know say oh grants on that diet i'll do that diet people need to find out what works best for themselves so what my diet is is primarily beef and bison um, white rice brown rice black beans uh, salt and coffee and i've been on that diet for about six and a half years and so maybe just some other comments the reason i use bison versus beef for the most part it's just because it's lower in fat and i'm not saying that beef isn't perfectly fine i think beef is perfectly fine even beef with quite a bit of fat in it's perfectly fine nothing wrong with it but i'm just trying to eliminate all possible vitamin a from my uh, personal diet to prove a point that a human can live for seven or ten years with no vitamin a in their diet so that's you know, that's my personal mission. I'm not doing that for health reasons anymore. It's just for me to prove a point. Do you get fat in your diet? I mean, other than the ones that may be in some beef, but you don't eat added fats? No, I don't. Uh, and I would love to find a good, safe source of fat. Um, I, no, I don't add any fat. I, you know, when I, when I cook beef, uh, you know, roast beef typically with, with fat on it, I definitely eat all the fat. Uh, so I'm not adverse to fat at all. And bison is very low in fat. And that's kind of probably about 80% of my meat consumption. And other than that, I don't have fat. Sometimes with your hormones, if you, you know, don't eat enough fat, then you can have thinning skin. So how do, you know, I know this, I'm going yeah. in circles a little bit, but it's like, how do we know, right? Like, I'm, a, I'm guessing that ever since you were diagnosed with any of the liver issues, and then the eczema, you cleaned up your diet in other areas too. So how do we know specifically that, It was the vitamin E and not some other, you know, like toxic oils in your diet or something else. Yeah, well, I had a pretty good diet leading up to my disease condition. So, uh, so I wasn't really eating a terrible diet at all. I thought I was eating a very healthy diet. And so, uh, but I did kind of experiment with stuff, you know, throughout last four or five years, I did add back gluten and white uh, sourdough bread. And I did it for a good long period of time too. It was just um, you know, for about three or four months, I replaced the rice for this sourdough bread and I had no adverse reaction to it really. Now, be, I was very careful to make sure that the bread had no canola oil in it. 
And then uh, the other experiment I did was with, you know, high dose sugar. It was, you know, ridiculous. I was doing like 200 grams of sugar a day and no adverse reactions to that. Uh, Health-wise or body weight-wise or really anything is kind of surprising. So I did re-challenge myself with some of those kind of more kind of commonly uh, viewed as, you know, negative uh, dietary items. But to answer your question, you know, I don't think people should look at me as kind of the de facto, you know, reference case. And that's why I kind of, you know, published the ebooks that I published and put together the form that I put together because I wanted to, you know, try to get other people taking this on. And now we have, you know, hundreds of people. It's probably close to about a thousand people worldwide that are doing this. And a lot of people are indeed recovering their health and they have a wide variety of diets. So, you know, my own personal diet with, white and brown rice a lot of people aren't doing that and they're staying away from the beans so you know large variety of diets with the common theme of eliminating vitamin a from their diet or reducing the vitamin a in their diet and a lot of people are experiencing health improvements now what's happening is you know this is by no means a quick fix and it's no by no means an easy fix because what's happening uh, often is people experience uh, pretty good uh, improvement in their health and uh, you know within a two or three month period they start kind of sliding backwards and they start experiencing worse health and we're getting a good understanding of why that's happening um, so this is not you know an easy thing to take on and it's not you know it's not a it's not a panacea i mean that could be the herxheimer effect you know where just you are detoxing and then you could just feel worse um yeah how long after typically from the thousand people that are doing this i mean how long do you notice or how long does it take for them to start noticing improvements in their symptoms? So what happens, uh, I'm going to say typically, you know, of course, every, it's all over the map. You know, yeah. there's people coming from all kinds of different um, health histories, dietary histories, and situations. So it's, you know, the results are all over the map. I did put together a survey uh, back in August, and it's up on, my, up on my blog, and people can go and look at that and, and read it. So you kind of see this general improvement in health. But to answer your question, so what happens typically, um, uh, within about two or three months, people experience a really uh, kind of profound uh, improvement in their health. So this is kind of the honeymoon period. And then for a lot of people, they kind of start sliding backwards and they end up in either, you know, back to where they were or even slightly worse. Uh, Now there are other people, and I'm kind of seeing a pattern, is people that come into this and if they're generally healthy and they don't have, you know, a disease condition and they take this on, for those people, um, they don't really typically slide backwards they they take it on they start to see improvement in their health and they just get better and better and better so but you mentioned the word detox and that's the you know the term that's been used in this community to describe what's going on with this sliding backwards originally i was a little bit opposed to that term it kind of sounds like a lame kind of cop out oh this is just detox and you know we'll have to put up with it but it's actually proving out so what what happens is when people take on the diet they go on a low vitamin a diet uh it, you know, they start experiencing good health, start sliding backwards. And what's happening is their vitamin A serum levels are actually increasing, sometimes quite dramatically. So, you know, with about 30% of the North American population have fatty liver disease, as you take this on and you're not storing vitamin A into your liver anymore, the liver is starting to detoxify itself and kind of normalize. But in doing so, it's dumping vitamin A back into serum. And that is toxic. It's actually one of the most toxic forms of vitamin A. So I mentioned, you know, retinoic acid. So kind of the second most toxic form is what's called vitamin A palmitate, the storage form in the liver. So the liver starts kind of dumping that back into serum and then you start feeling really crappy because now you're actually internally poisoning yourself. And so the trick is, you know, how do we get this out of circulation faster and safer? So how do you do that then? I mean, do you not fully remove the vitamin A? I mean, how do you that's, that's a really good question. And we, when I say we, um, you know, myself, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of hoping that we can kind of gravitate towards that understanding. There's a whole bunch of people kind of, you know, personally experimenting with this. So dietary fiber is uh, probably quite important. Dietary fat, you mentioned dietary fat. I think if you had a really high fat content in your diet, it would be fantastic because that would help for, um, you know, 
increase bile flow. So the vitamin A that's coming out of the liver is getting uh, excreted into bile. The bile comes into your intestine, and unfortunately, like something like 85 or 90% of the vitamin A that's in that bile gets reabsorbed. And so that is the, you know, the dangerous uh, situation and spot for it. So if you have adequate dietary fiber, maybe adequate dietary fat, you're going to expel uh, a lot of that rather than having come back Reabsorb. into circulation. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because most of our bile is reabsorbed just because it's so expensive to make within the body. So it yeah. makes a lot of sense. So dietary salt, very important. You, you do not want to compromise your, your bile production, bile flow. Oh, yeah, I agree. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many like avenues that people focus in on and it's like the oxal the community that's into the oxalates. Yeah. You notice these symptoms and it's like, how do you reduce it without poisoning yourself and poisoning some of the cells that can then never regenerate type of thing. And then even right. in this vitamin A, I think there are people that try carnivore and they feel great. And then all of a sudden, like you said, they start regressing. And I wonder if it's, you know, this is not that everyone has to try this, but that, you know, there is a big push for eating organ meats in the community. Yeah. If I can, if I can interrupt you and, and, you know, ask you, um, yeah. you know, to do your own research here, because I see the carnivore diet as a huge opportunity. I think it is such a great, fantastic, natural experiment that's going on because we have people that have basically taken on kind of the ultimate elimination diet, you know, and it's primarily one food. And we've actually got two camps in that carnivore uh, community. We've got the camp that is eating, you know, muscle meat and maybe maybe some eggs and stuff and then we've got the camp that's eating muscle meat and organs and you know liver and kidneys let's say livers both of those would be toxic so if you can and you know i'd love for you to do this is you know pull the community find you know get that group of people that are purely muscle meat carnivores and see how they're doing and then the group in the community that's muscle meat plus the organ meats and see how they're doing and i'll tell you what i think is the one of the important biomarkers for looking at how they're doing and that's the ldl cholesterols so the ldl cholesterol is actually a carrier uh, lipid for vitamin a so as your vitamin A storage goes up in your liver, your LDL levels are going to be going up. So there's been this great debate in the cardiovascular community about, you know, the pros and cons or the, um, you know, the significance of LDL cholesterol. There's people saying, yes, it's important. People say, no, it's not important. But it actually is, but it's not the LDL cholesterol particle itself. It's what's inside the LDL particle, and that is vitamin A. So my prediction is what you'll see if you can survey the community, your community is the people that are on the pure muscle meat carnivore diet, their LDL levels will have gone down. Whereas those that are on muscle meat plus uh, liver, uh, their LDL levels will have gone up. And we're actually seeing that people are sharing their, their cholesterol numbers on our form. We're, you know, we're definitely seeing people reducing their their cholesterol levels, specifically the LDL cholesterol number, being on a low vitamin A diet. Love to get that data. That's so interesting. Well, it's, you know what the problem is? And you're absolutely right. There's two different camps. The issue that I'm seeing, though, is that, you know, with all the supplementation, these like other kind of alternative ways to get us to be eating liver, I think more and more of the community is now taking it, even though they're not, you know, consuming it in the food form. Yeah, I understand. And so I, I wonder, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of even people in the community I know, but I don't know how many people don't touch liver. I think there's a smaller few, but I don't think it's a whole really? lot at this point. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, this is going to be tragic because I'll make a prediction that this will, if, if someone doesn't kind of zero in on this and, and understand that there's this distinction, uh, the carnivore community is going to implode. Because, oh, it's already. <laughs> yeah, because what's going to happen is so many people are going to get sick and it's, yeah. it's going to be severe. And, it's, um, and that's why I wanted you on. I mean, as much as, you know, I'm a big fan of butter, I think chicken liver pate, because chicken liver actually has a little less vitamin A than beef liver does. So I've okay. been a fan of that, mm. but it still does have a lot of vitamin A. So yeah. Um, and I've always been on the fence about cod liver oil, but I just wanted you on because in case someone in the community is not feeling as well as they used to be, maybe it's not the hormones, maybe it's not their thyroid, maybe it's actually vitamin A. It's just a different avenue that people can kind yeah, of look into. For sure. Um, but butter is still pretty high. I mean, just when I was looking at the data, it looks like uh, butter has a pretty good amount of vitamin A. Yeah. Um, and so for people that are just eating muscle meat, but adding 
a lot of uh, butter, that could still increase their vitamin E, right? Or no? It, it, yeah, it, it could. Um, still kind of, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude less than liver by far. And so, you know, yeah, I personally, I'm not going to eat butter. And a lot of people in my form have tried butter and had a bad reaction to it. So they, you know, very few people are actually consuming butter that I know of. I think butter should be off the menu. That's my personal opinion. Okay. I wonder how the makeup of a lot of our homogenized pasteurized butters and uh, dairies have the added vitamin A, but I wonder yeah. what, what the, and I haven't done this research actually, but I wonder what the composition of raw butter looks like. Is it still that high in vitamin A? I suspect it wouldn't be. It's going to be seasonal. So, you know, oh, yeah, summer yeah, that, right. you know, butter, butter that's made in the summer is going to be higher because, you know, the cattle are, are eating grass. I'd be far less concerned about that. If you could find a natural farm source of butter, that would be, you know, kind of the safest if you're really kind of uh, determined to get butter in your diet. A lot of my community members and the clients I work with, they do better so they sleep better through the night when they add fat. And a lot of times, like they don't like eating the tallow or the suet because it just tastes too rubbery. And okay. so then they opt for butter. But, you know, maybe there's another alternative. I do like olive oil because it tends to lower your LDL. But okay. I, but olive oil also tends to be cut with a lot of seed oils. So yeah, unfortunately, that's true. Yeah, yeah tough. Okay. So yeah, I think it's a, you know, I think this conversation is just really important because we do talk a lot about nose to tail and eating everything in the animal. And I think it's good, but we don't live in the yesteryears where there was one organ for the whole tribe and maybe they got it once every month or so, right? It's yeah, yeah. liver. And so right. I always recommend to my clients um, even when I did my nutritional research, I just saw that vitamin A and copper are really high in organ meats. And so I've kind of took a step back and said, maybe you should just have at most like four to six ounces a week. And it sounds like even that's a lot, but you know, the, like these other people that you've mentioned, they say there's no limit and you shouldn't be scared of, you know, cod liver oil. You shouldn't be scared of uh, vitamin A toxicity. It doesn't really exist. Um, oh. Yeah. And, yeah. It's uh, a... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it kind of maybe to help put it in perspective, I guess, on, on timing. So, you know, the big factor here is time. You know, this is decades of time. And so uh, one woman um, kind of last year sent me an email and she said she, she was eating liver every day for, I think she said, 20 years. I kind of have a hard time believing that, but let's let's take it at face value and say she was. And then she said, well, she's horribly sick and she's got all kinds of autoimmune diseases and, um, you know, whatever, uh, we'll just leave it at that. So it kind of gives you an indication of how long you could get away with eating liver, uh, you know, on a regular basis and not kind of feel the side effects of it. So yeah, it, it is tricky. Um, well, I did a hair mineral test on, and obviously they don't show vitamin A, but I did a hair mineral test on one lady that was eating um, a liver type of food um, okay. every day. She just started incorporating because, you know, we hear in the carnivore community, organ meats, and it's true, organ meats have a lot of nutrition, but there's can be side effects of the excess, right? And so right. when we did her blood, um, her hair mineral test, her copper was through the roof. Oh, okay. I was like, you need to stop. And she just was, and she came to me because she's just stopped feeling well when, you know, she was starting to eat a variety on the carnivore diet, it's especially organ meats. Right. So I told her to cut the um, no liver whatsoever, not chicken, right. not beef. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think she started feeling a little bit better, but you know, we didn't get it tested again yet. So right. I think you know, one of the failings of, you know, kind of the analysis with, you know, eating liver specifically. So the liver is the detoxification or organ of an animal. So, you know, and the people on the carnivore diet kind of vilified plants and saying, all oh, these plants are full of toxins. We're not going to eat them. But, you know, a cow out grazing grass in the field is going to be ingesting a bunch of plant toxins. And those plant toxins are going to accumulate in that liver. And so by us eating that, we're getting, you know, big dose of plant toxins. And so it's so ironic that people are, you know, taking on the carnivore diet to eliminate plants, but yet they're ingesting the worst part of it through the liver. Uh, you know, and that is interesting. Done. I mean, so I've done research with glyphosate and okay. they, it's, it's not as dangerous as eating the plants specifically because um, there are amino acids that could protect you from the animal meat. So in that right. sense, 
but you're right. Like the liver itself will have um, toxins stored. So, and and that makes sense. And I'm sure I'm going to make my kids so happy by never having them eat liver. But um, yeah, I think it's just something to consider. And I, I did a blog post not too long ago where my kind of over all analysis of the carnivore diet, if you want to do it long term, considering minerals, I mean, magnesium is just low in beef. So I think eating a variety, and it doesn't have to include organs, like if you eat some seafood and um, some beef and chicken and pork, and just having a a variety can possibly give you a better nutrient profile than just eating muscle meat, or just eating beef plus um, beef liver and other organs. Mm-hmm. That was the research I did. And it, that one's really easy. I mean, you just pull out all the nutritional information, right. the different foods, and then look at the daily values. It was super simple. But we don't talk about a lot of this stuff. And I think, you know, we revere this whole, you know, eating nose to tail. So I think it's important to talk about this. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, I may just actually do a survey. I may, you know, I'll, I can reach out to my community and yeah. ask how many of you don't do um, organ meats? And then what's your LDL? So you're, yeah. you're, assumption is that LDL will be lower, right? Is that what? Yeah. Now we need to kind of be a bit more specific. I think it'd be important to survey people that are kind of one year in and beyond. Mm -hmm. So this might not show up in the first year, let's say maybe it will, but you know, people that have been on the carnivore diet for one plus years, that would be fantastic piece of data. Uh, I would love to see that data. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, I do notice that, um, and I, it's normal because we're all eating more saturated fats, but most carnivores, their LDL does go up. So mm, it's just, okay. I wonder how we would measure what is high versus maybe it's just the average of the populations. I don't know. Yeah, just compare do- the two groups, you know, just, I would say, you know, take the average of the two, two groups and, and see who's higher and who's lower. Okay, yeah, that'll be yeah. interesting. I, I saw on your, um, one of your blog posts that you donate blood. So why do you do that? Well, I, I, I did that before I was getting sick. And then when I got sick, I was... Um, prevented from doing that. And so once I got the green light to do it, I started doing it again. But um, so my mission, my personal mission, as as I mentioned before, was to prove that vitamin A is not a vitamin. One of my goals in proving that is, you know, here is a human that has been living without vitamin A in their diet for seven years. I'm going to go to at least 10. And so I am getting probably a tiny little trace amount of vitamin A from the beef I eat every now and then. Uh, and maybe some other sources. So I'm, I'm using the blood donations and the plasma donations to offset that. So, okay. okay, I'm getting rid of blood. And with that blood donation is, you know, I'm getting rid of some of my serum level of vitamin A. So that's kind of the reason. And it's just proving so hard and long for people to detoxify. So I think it's beneficial. Um, and once again, each person needs to kind of decide what's best for themselves. You know, as we wrap up, would you say that if you are feeling any of the symptoms that are on acne.org, um, some of the ones that you mentioned earlier, that maybe they should start kind of lowering their vitamin A um, consumption, that maybe they should just stop organ meats? Oh, yeah. Um, and it, it's not just acne.org. You can go to any, just you know, okay. search for vitamin A toxicity, you'll get a list of the, you know, the, the symptoms. The reason I mentioned acne, acne.org and their, their graphic, they had a really nice graphic okay. of the human body with, you know, kind of pointer to each, you know, tissue. And, and, I'll, and I'll link to your blog post. I mean, it's very thorough. Okay. So, okay. yeah, I'll link to um, it. I think, yeah, to repeat, I think, you know, everyone should really seriously consider, you know, not eating uh, organs, uh, especially liver and kidneys, and reducing their vitamin A. If you're, if you're healthy and young, and you know, you don't have to worry, you know, this is not, I'm not kind of pulling the alarm bell saying, oh, this is a poison that's going to kill us all. You know, your body's well equipped to deal with it in certain amounts. But if you are starting to get sick, then I think it'd be prudent to cut back on it. Okay. And You have to understand, um, this is kind of, for me, you know, kind of the clincher, you know, the medical textbook definition of vitamin A activity is um, stem cell differentiation. And so, you know, the claim in the medical literature without vitamin A, your stem cells are not going to differentiate, your skin is going to peel off, and you're going to go blind, and you're going to die. Well, that hasn't happened. Um, But uh, kind of buried in that definition is uh, how does vitamin A cause stem cell differentiation is by inducing uh, gene expression. So these gene expressions are measured by the proteins that a cell is generating. And there's now 500 different proteins that are attributed to vitamin A activity. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I was trying to write about my first 
ebook was this whole definition of autoimmunity is a perfect match for vitamin A toxicity. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, if someone's experiencing autoimmune diseases, you know, fatty liver, um, uh, diabetes is hugely implicated here. Um, you know, there's a big tie-in with insulin resistance and vitamin A toxicity. You know, people can look up what's called STRA6 uh, receptor that's induced by vitamin A and that induces uh, insulin resistance. So there's a lot of diseases that I think are attributable to vitamin A toxicity. That's great. I'd love to get more involvement and, in, you know, more people looking at this. Maybe one thing I will mention is... You know, when I started this, I'm just an engineer um, geologist coming into this field. And you might think, well, what the heck is an engineer doing looking at this? What people should understand is an engineering degree is a problem-solving degree. And for me, this is just another problem. But since, uh, you know, putting out my e-books and kind of the development of the community, I've been contacted by three different academic researchers in this field. One has been looking at vitamin A toxicity for about 30 years and some other uh, two researchers uh, at universities, they've contacted me and are very supportive and saying, you know, they're in general agreement with this theory. Um, so it's not just me. And uh, I don't want anyone to think, you know, I'm just the sole piece of evidence. There are now, you know, hundreds of people that are slowly recovering their health. Academic researchers are backing this up. I've had some medical doctors contact me saying they're supportive of this. So it's not just me. I, I think that until people openly do their own research and make their own decisions, they can't just say something is false, right? I mean, like you were mentioning that there was one study that then solidified that vitamin A is this vitamin and mm-hmm. um, it's you know essential in all these things, but the same kind of theory happened with iodine in the other way, right? So they, there was this one, it starts with the W, I can't even remember the name, but that study showed that uh, iodine is toxic for the body and it can cause hyperthyroid and damage, but it's actually not good information either. So you just, it's really interesting that if we just were to go to the source and then really start looking into studies, instead of just listening to people and saying, oh, maybe we have to eat organ meat right? Or we have to do this and that, like, maybe, maybe we should do a little bit more research and just come to our own conclusions. Because when someone's sick, any option is something that they're willing to try. And that is something I've seen with my clients. Okay. Yeah. And you know, one other comment is that original Wolbach and Hall study that was done in uh, 1926, we had a plan this year to redo that study scientifically oh, okay. at an American university. Then with the outbreak of COVID, that's, that um, replication of that study was put on hold. But we hope to get back to it. Um, you know, it's going to depend on what happens with this pandemic, but we are going to get, redo that study. You know, so oh, scientifically, awesome. it will be done at a university and you know, we'll publish the results, obviously. So you know, this has been really helpful. I think that if people are still struggling with issues on a carnivore diet, maybe you know, there's all these rabbit holes that people investigate. They say it's histamines, autoimmune, you're not eating enough organ meats and you're not nutritionally... Um, nourished or you're not eating enough protein or fats and you know i'm even in that bandwagon of all of those things and so Mm. vitamin a can be an option right so we can get our sources of uh, nutrition and other foods that don't have a ton of vitamin a so and everything in nutrition the more and more i'm into it and look into things it's i think balance is really key and i think that when we try to you know mega dose on a certain thing it's not always a good thing. Not a good thing. Yeah, totally agree. One thing I wanted to ask you before we go is, um, you mentioned vitamin deficiency and how there would be all these symptoms. What is kind of the threshold of uh, you being vitamin A deficient? Well, this is the irony is the symptoms of vitamin A deficiency are very, very close to those for vitamin A toxicity. And this is where the confusion originates from. And this is why it's so tricky. That 1926 Wilbach and Hall study what they actually observed was vitamin A toxicity. So they ended up poisoning their animals. And if we kind of fast forward to the 1970s, so part of the diet that they used um, in that study, that original study, was they used heated casein. So they heated the casein in an alcohol. Casein is a carrier protein for vitamin A. Adding the alcohol and heat will oxidize it into retinoic acid, the most toxic form of vitamin A. And so they fed this diet, what they thought was a vitamin A deficient diet to these animals, and they all died in 10 to 12 weeks. 
um, and they said, oh my God, we've discovered vitamin A deficiency. Well, no, they didn't. They discovered vitamin A toxicity because this was a toxic diet they fed to these animals. And this is hugely supported by the research done from um, T. Colin Campbell, you know, this major advocate, one of the kind of the godfathers of, of the vegan movement, because in the 1970s, he was looking at the toxicity of casein, and he came to the conclusion that casein was the most carcinogenic substance ever known to man. So by feeding casein to animals, they were killing their animals and giving them cancer in the 1970s. That same heated casein was used in that original study. So I think that's the fundamental flaw with that study. So the symptoms of vitamin A the, Deficiency are the, what you'll look and, and see in the literature is they're almost a perfect match for vitamin A toxicity. So skin peeling, uh, this is vitamin A deficiency, skin pe peeling, blindness, uh, you know, most commonly, you know, vision problems, uh, neurological problems. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a match. And the reason this match is because that was the very definition of... Sure. I'm so new to this research too that I don't have um, a ton to kind of counter, but it's, uh, yeah. I think it's, I think just from the nutritional perspective of if you were to um, analyze each food and their nutrition, I mean, there is a lot of vitamin A in certain um, animal products. And so maybe you know, it's always something to consider. I mean, if the daily values are supposed to be at 100%, or at least we try to reach it, then maybe we should consider if in excess, it might be too much. And I think it's something to consider when, you know, we don't care if we're not hitting daily values for other nutrients, like magnesium is something that, uh, and potassium, I think are minerals that we have a hard time achieving or hitting the 100% daily value, even vitamin C on a carnivore diet. And we say it doesn't matter. But then what about the excess? So what if we have too much? I mean, I, we don't really talk about that in the community. And I, I think it's really bizarre, actually. But, you know, I wouldn't be so concerned, you know, things like vitamin C, it's, it's water soluble. So your body's going to get rid of it very fast. Right. The problem with, you know, A, D, E, and K, they're fat soluble molecules, and they're going to accumulate. So that's, that's the big distinction. Do you think, um, and, you know, you may not have done research on this, but do you think the other fat soluble vitamins also accumulate? Well, they do. Uh, now, vitamin D is a bit tricky, and I'm not really that concerned with vitamin D because your body produces it naturally. So at least it's a natural vitamin that the body produces. Vitamin E in some of the literature is stated to increase the amount of vitamin A that goes back into circulation. So you might want to be careful with that. Vitamin K was looked at in the literature as an antidote to vitamin A, kind of proved not to be. So I'm not so sure about that. So I really haven't looked at the other fat soluble vitamins from a toxicity point of view. I'm just really focused on vitamin A. Do you supplement vitamin D? No, I don't. No. Okay. Would you no. ever? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. And, okay, you know, I, agree, but... um, I wouldn't because it's actually, you know, the form that in, in the supplements typically uh, is, you know, a toxic form of vitamin D, yes. uh, which has to be metabolized. But also I had my vitamin D checked in the last two years and I'm, I'm right up there. So you oh, know, okay. no, no concern about vitamin D. Do you go out in the sun at all? Or I mean, I, I, I don't go out a lot, but I, I, I do, um, you know, when I, when I can, I guess. Uh, originally, when I was very sick with eczema, I couldn't go out in the sun for more than 10 seconds. And so, oh, wow. uh, yeah, now I can go out in the sun for you know, a long time and actually can once again. So it's good. It's okay. Cool. So where can people find your group, um, more of your research, uh, where, you know, if people wanted to get in touch with you? So I've, I've got a blog. It's G Generu. So it's G G E N E R E U X dot blog. And uh, there's a discussion forum there. I've posted three free ebooks that people can read kind of you can with kind of different themes to those ebooks and people can contact me through that blog uh, but I just want people to know that I am not actively you know coaching or giving people advice you know I don't have the time or cycles for that that's that's not me um, so yeah you know, anyway that's where people can dig into more and on my forum there's a uh, a section called the science of it. And so a lot of the studies that I mentioned are all referenced there in many, many, many more studies uh, that are there, you know, people can dig into and read. Okay, this has been very, very fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, I hope that people, you know, really look into this and see, you know, um, where their kind of journey is with healing, and maybe this is an avenue that they can actually use. So thank you again for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. See you, Judy. Bye.
Okay, guys, I hope you found this interview helpful. I know it's a lot of information to process. Um, even for me, I knew that some of the livers had a lot of vitamin A and even copper, but I mean, this just puts it to a whole different level. So if you feel any of the symptoms after you do some research about vitamin A, you may want to just experiment and try reducing some of the foods that are higher in vitamin A and see how you feel. And if you notice in a few months that you actually feel better, maybe it's something that you can actually pursue and definitely check out the research as Grant talks about. I think he's a lot more humble. You know, he's done his work and he's done a lot of research and he's looked into a lot of the literature. So if you feel that you have some of these toxicities and now if you don't, maybe you just limit a little bit of the organ consumption. I just think it makes a lot of sense that we eat the amount that maybe we would have years ago. And I don't think we were always eating ounces and ounces every single day. All right, guys, I hope that this was helpful. Um, please make sure to subscribe. Please make sure to share with those that may actually need this. You know the drill, make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys next week. Bye.